Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to go ahead and take a look at um, uh, getting into quantum mechanics. Now, quantum mechanics is very, very strange. It's very difficult to comprehend. Um, it's not something we're going to spend a lot of detail in, in focusing on the, 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 the specifics of this. We're just going to kind of get an overview, enough of this model uh, to, try, to use in class and to talk about chemistry. Um, but it is a very, very interesting theory. Uh, so first of all, um, if you haven't watched the video, take a look at the Bohr model video. Um, it'll give you some background information because that's where we left off on the development of the atom. Um, in this video, we're going to talk about uh, getting into more of the quantum mechanical aspects of it because Bohr brought in quantized energy and talked about the atom having quantized energy. Well, he put electrons into specific orbits around the atom. So we said that there's uh, a nucleus with a positive charge and then there's these orbits that are going around that he called energy levels or electron shells and that's where the electron is sitting in these particular um, energy levels okay or orbits and these were thought of at the time as specific you know orbits like planets going around the sun well Werner Heisenberg in 1927 looked at this model was trying to you know come up with some other explanations here and realized that if you're trying to figure out some information about this electron okay you're trying to figure out where this electron is and where it's going because we can do that with the earth going around the sun we know where it's at we know where it's going um, and we know where, it's, where it will be so we can make a lot of predictions here so Werner Heisenberg was trying to do this and he realized that you can't do that with the electron because there's a problem here, something called the uncertainty principle. Again, this can get a little complicated, but the idea here is that if I'm going to try to figure out where that electron is or where it's going, I need to know two things. I need to know its momentum and I need to know its position. Those two are the two things, two requirements for knowing where something is and where it will be. Well, the problem is if I try to see the electron, I have to add energy to it. Now, if we saw when we talked about Bohr's model, when you add energy to the electron, you move the electron. The electron's going to move out of the way. So there's a problem here. Every time we try to see the electron, we alter the electron's position. And that leads us to a lot of uncertainty about the, about the electron. Now, there's more to this than I'm giving you right now. It's just that we don't need to get into that to the details of the uncertainty principle. It just, what it's doing here is it's showing us that there's some problems with Bohr's model. That Bohr's model of the uh, orbits around the nucleus is not completely sufficient. Um, but he was correct in the idea of quantized energy. So he had something right, but it wasn't quite all there. And that's the key behind um, understanding the, the uncertainty principle. That you cannot know the position and the exact momentum at the same time. I can know one or the other. Now I can do this experiment and I can say, okay, the electron was here, but then I don't know where it's going to be. And that's the issue. So we can detect where the electrons were, but we just don't know where they're going to be after that. Okay. And we don't know where they were before that. So this really throws scientists into a, a tailspin here trying to figure out what to do. Irvin Schrodinger comes along and he does is he talks about the wave mechanical model. So what he is going to do is instead of looking at electrons as particles going around the nucleus, right? Instead of thinking of this as particles going around, he's going to treat this as energy. He's going to treat the electron as if it were a wave going around. And I know this again, this is just a model trying to explain here, but a wave, just like any other scientific wave that we've talked about in the past and probably earlier classes, that it has a wave nature to it, that it's not a particle at all, that it might be actually energy might be what this electron is. Again, this is getting very abstract and very crazy. But the thing about this is that it works. It, it works very, very well. I mean, when Erwin uh, Schrodinger put this model together um, and, and described the, and again, he uses very advanced mathematical calculations. We're just not going to get into it at this level, um, but it really helped to make sense of where that electron is and it really put things together. So what he does is this ushers in the idea of quantum mechanics, studying um, the small pieces. The quantum is talking about those small pieces of energy. Quantum refers to small particles. Mechanics, talks about motion. So this is the study of the motion of small particles is what quantum mechanics does. And this stuff just is absolutely crazy when you start getting into understanding and looking at some more stuff with, with uh, quantum theory. Anyhow, the idea of this quantum mechanical wave model uh, is that we're going to treat the electrons as waves. And what he does is he changes this from an orbit to an orbital. 
not the best use of terminology here, but the orbital is now going to be something different. So instead of saying that you conclusively know where that electron is, right? We've said in the past, well, we know where that electron is. We're going to say where the electron most likely is because energy kind of is not in one particular location, but kind of all over the place. So we're going to say instead of the electron being in a particular position, we're going to say we know its probable location. So if you think about an x, y, z coordinate system, three-dimensional graph, if we were to plot the electron, we've got the nucleus in the center, what we can do is we can say that the electron is somewhere outside of this nucleus. Well, we can do an experiment and detect where the electron is. We can say, okay, the electron is here. Now the electron's here. So we can say where the electron is, but we don't know where it's going to be next. Okay, it's going to keep doing this pattern over and over and over and over again. So if we keep doing this enough, we can develop a pattern and see kind of where the electron is most likely going to be found. And if we notice, we get this region in space where the electron is most likely to be found. Now, is it always found in this region? No, sometimes it's found outside of it. But for the most part, this is where the electron is. This is a three-dimensional orbital. It's a region in space that talks about how where we can find the electron most likely. Now, as the electron gets more energy, the electron is going to be able to jump to higher energy levels, and it's going to be further and further out. So we can look at orbitals describing the region in space where the electron is most likely and the energy it has. Now, the thing about orbitals is it can only hold two electrons at the most. Okay? All right, so let's take a look at orbital properties. Um, the properties of orbitals are that they're in these, they have a particular amount of energy and there's a particular shape to them, okay, because of where the electrons are located. The energy levels, um, or electron shells, again, I prefer energy levels myself, but some people call them shells, um, it's going to stay intact. The idea that the electrons are sitting in these concentric circles, one with inside of the, each other, is still going to be true. That, that idea of quantized energy still holds true from Bohr's model. Uh, the only difference is that the energy levels are subdivided. They're actually, and this is why Bohr's model fell apart, is that inside of these energy levels are sublevels. And this is where this model is going to start to fall apart. And we're not going to be able to draw those sublevels that are inside of these energy levels. So we're going to have some trouble here. So we're going to have to come up with another way of describing these. But as far as the energy, all of the sublevels have pretty much the same energy inside of them. So if we're talking energy wise, this idea of n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, so on and so forth, still is going to work. Okay. Now what we found too is that the orbitals are going to have unique shapes. Okay. Again, I'm not getting into the explanation of this. It gets beyond the scope of the class. What we're going to do is we're going to look at four shapes, S, P, D, and F. That's what they were designated, S, P, D, and F. S is going to have a spherical shape. So this would be an S orbital here. So again, it's that traditional. And this is why Bohr's model worked, because the lowest energy level was a spherical shape. And hydrogen being the lowest energy level uh, electron fit this model perfectly. Now, we go up to a P. The P now has this dumbbell shape. Now, the thing about the P is that it actually has these dumbbell shapes in three orientations in space. So you'd imagine this dumbbell being rotated and put on the x-axis and then being rotated and put on the y-axis. So there's three orientations. So therefore, there will be three orbitals for that P uh, um, shape. Okay. Then there's a D, which gets into these weird like clover shape things. Uh, and F, I don't even put on here because it's just way too hard to visualize. Again, this is getting very abstract. I mean, look at this thing here. It's this weird shape with this donut shape around the center. You know, the electron never sits in the in between there. It's only in this ring structure or in this these these double lobe dumbbell shape. Again, weird stuff. I can't get into the explanations, but this is the consequence of the wave mechanical model. Okay. Um, now, there's a lot of evidence to show that this is true. Don't get me wrong. Just because it's hard to explain doesn't mean that it's not true. So one last piece we need is Pauli's exclusion principle. Pauli's exclusion principle talks about that if we put electrons in orbitals, so if we're going to put electrons, remember, there's two electrons that can fit into an orbital. Well, when they do that, they aren't going to be exactly the same electrons because remember, electrons are repelling each other and pushing away. So this is something called spin. Now spin is not necessarily that the electron is spinning. I mean they use this terminology but if you were to imagine that this is the electron and this is an axis going through the electron and the electron were spinning in this direction we would call this a down spin. Okay? 
because of the way it spins. When it spins in this direction, it's considered a downspin. When the electron is spinning in this direction, it's considered an upspin. Okay, uh, getting into the explanations of that. No, I'm sorry. Um, this is the up. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. The idea is that they have up and down spins. Technically, if you want, you have to use a right hand rule. That's an upspin. This is a downspin. So. The idea is that the electrons aren't really spinning, but they have this magnetic property. And that's really what this translates into is this magnetic property. And this is really the origins of magnetism. So the idea that the electrons, when they are near each other, one of those electrons is going to rotate. So if I have two upspin electrons and I put them in the same orbital, one of those electrons is going to rotate and flip down so that there's up and down or next to each other. Again, We'll, we'll look at some examples of this and kind of go over it and explain a little bit later. But that's the idea, upspins and downspins. So whenever an electrons are put into orbitals, two per orbital, you're always going to put them, if this box represents the orbital, we're always going to put one electron up and one electron down. And that's the idea behind um, Pauli exclusion principle. So now we get all the pieces, and we can kind of put this together and kind of look at what's going on here. You can think of... Uh, the energy levels, sublevels, and orbital ideas. This is where the electrons are. The electrons are going to sit in an energy level, but it's also in a sublevel located in an orbital. Okay. So think about you. You live in Illinois, you live in a city, and you live on a street. So we can figure out and pinpoint where your location is. Okay. So the electron is going to have the same idea. It sits in an energy level, which has a sublevel, and the first energy level only has um, one sublevel. So each sublevel uh, or each energy level has a number of sublevels equal to the energy level. So energy level two has two sublevels. Energy level four has four sublevels. There's the 1s, one orbital, two electrons. In each of those orbitals, the total number in that energy level is um, the, the uh, two. And I don't know why I repeated that over, but that seems to be the same thing on the other side. Second energy level has a 2s and a 2p. So it has two orbitals. Remember the uh, two sublevels. Remember that the p's always have three orbitals. Okay, so therefore there's two electrons per orbital. So there's six in there, and that gives us a total of eight. Remember, Bohr's model said that there's two electrons in the first energy level, eight and 18, and then didn't get to it, but there were 32 in the, the, the fourth energy level. This is the reason why. Bohr did not know this middle part. He was not aware of the sublevel uh, idea, and that really threw off his model. So the third energy level breaks down into the third, 3s, 3p, and 3d. Now, if we compare a 2s to a 1s, they're going to be spherical in shape, the only difference is that a 1s has a smaller diameter than a 2s because the electron has more energy. The number in the front, when we look at this designation, when we look at this uh, 2s, 2p designation, the number in the front is the energy level and the s is the shape. Okay, So that's when we're looking at this designation, this 2s business. The 2 is the energy level, s is the shape. So when the energy level goes up, the electron has more energy to get away from the nucleus. So therefore, if I had a 3s, then I'm going to have a bigger orbital. Okay, The atomic orbital is going to be bigger, so it's going to have a bigger shape to it. So it's the same shape, it's just that the number in the front tells us that it gets bigger and bigger. We would see the same thing with the p's. So a 2p and a 3p, the 3p would be bigger, and the 4p would be even bigger than that. Um, okay, so 1s, 2s, 3s, the shape. Um, I think that's pretty good. So the idea is that as the electron, so if we look and compare atoms, we're going to see that certain atoms are going to have a 3s electron, are going to be bigger than an atom with a 1s electron. All right, I know this is all very, very confusing, um, but if you watch the video lessons on uh, rules for writing orbital diagrams, all this stuff kind of comes together. And then later on, we have a video, I've got a video lesson on periodic trends that shows you how we use this. And I know. It seems crazy, but as you start using this and applying it more, it will make more sense. All right, so again, thanks again for watching, and I will talk to you later.